Hi, Stephen here for The Idiot Quilter, and here's another interview in my series of interviews with subscribers. Enjoy! Okay, everybody, it's Stephen here for The Idiot Quilter, and I do have a very special interview today with another male sewer quilter, uh, which you know is rare on here. And uh, I'm looking very much forward to talking to Chris Marchini, right? I yes. said it right. Yay, I got it right. Not that hard a name, but eh, I get tied up in my tongue anyways. So, uh, Chris, thank you so much for coming today on to the show and doing this. And uh, I'm really interested in talking to you beyond the the uh, reason that you were a male quilter and sewer, but also because I know you're big into AccuQuilt, and uh, so am I. And I've been watching your YouTube channel, and we'll talk more about that a little later on. But uh, I've been really interested in your approach to YouTube and your videos as well. And we'll, again, we'll talk more about that in a bit. But let's start right off with where are you located? Yeah. I am located in Portland, Oregon. And that's why my channel and my business is Rose City Originals, because Portland is the city of roses. Okay, that is something I did know. And that was something I was going to uh, ask you about why it was uh, called that. But okay, you've answered that for me. So let's start. Do you consider yourself a quilter or are you everything in the sewing world? Because I know you make clothing too. I do. Um, I'd make all of my own shirts. Lately, I have been primarily focused on quilting, but I... Like, I've been sewing for over 30 years, clothing, toys, stuff, like everything. But nowadays, I'm more a quilter. Okay, so how did you get started then into sewing? You say you've been doing it for over 30 years, so I imagine you were very young when you started. How'd that happen? My mom sewed a lot, so I was just always fascinated by, like, just the art of sewing. And so she taught me when I was probably around, I don't know, like eight years old, but I was not allowed to touch her sewing machine. Mm. So, you know, learned with just a needle and thread, I would cut up whatever fabric I could get a hold of, um, make little clothes for my stuffed animals or making stuffed animals. Um, and then when I got a little older, I was able to use her machine, got my own machine, and I've been sewing ever since. Okay, so when in this, over these years, did you start getting into doing quilts? That was probably a little over five years ago. So after my husband and I bought this house, I got a sewing room, like a dedicated sewing space. Right. And I was doing uh, children's clothing at the time because my kids were younger. So that I was, you know, being practical and making them clothes and whatever, but um they no longer live with me full time. So I didn't have them like at the ready to kind of like be my inspiration. So I kind of fell out of love with that, but I still loved sewing. Um, so I've been watching sewing YouTube for, for years. And the thought of doing like a whole quilt kind of intimidated me, but I just kind of sucked it up. I'm like, I'm just going to, I'm going to try it, see if I could do it. And I have been hooked on quilting ever since. And you've only been doing, you say, for about five years. So did you yeah. do like a lot of people did? They rediscovered quilting and sewing when the pandemic hit? Um, I started in like summer of 2018. So it was a, it was before the pandemic. Um, during the pandemic, my sewing shifted a lot towards masks. Like I don't know how many thousands of masks I made. <laughs> um, but still quilting at the same time because that's the, right. the fun part of it so yeah yeah I think a lot of us got into uh doing the masks and everything during the pandemic and I think we're all masked out as far as the sewing project is concerned yeah. yes absolutely <laughs> and I've been sewing probably or quilting for about as long as you too I started just before the pandemic I think I started in about 2017 and uh haven't looked back since and uh I really didn't have any influences in my family and I wasn't really interested in sewing at all didn't even have a machine and then circumstances were and I got a machine for crafting not not for mm -hmm. quilting and then I did a little project and thought oh what is this quilting thing all about and well the rest is history so you said that your your mom got you into sewing at a very early age did you have uh, any other influences in your family anybody anybody in your family that quilts for example 
no one in my family is really a quilter definitely crafters um like my whole family like does some sort of craft lots of needlework toll painting just all kinds of stuff my grandma was a sewer my mom was a sewer but no one really quilted right so i i grew up watching pbs and so sewing with nancy was really big yes. for me right. so i know she did everything like some episodes were about garment sewing and some were about quilting and i was always just fascinated watching that yeah when she uh departed this earth we lost a great resource great yes. yeah as well so yeah she was a great influence um so if you've been sewing all this time you must have a favorite creation or do you and if you do what would it be and it doesn't necessarily have to be a quilt <laughs> right i always say like my favorite make is usually my most recent make because yes, it's fresh it's fun um you know i've made so many things over the years it's really hard to pinpoint which one is my favorite um, I really have been enjoying quilting and there's a quilt that I designed that's called you should see me in a crown mm. uh, it's a like an image of a skull wearing a crown and that is probably my favorite when I had the idea in my head it was six days from like oh this would be a cool quilt to a fully formed quilt bound labeled ready to go so like, yeah. hyper fixated on it and I still love that quilt Okay. And that is an unfair question because I think most of us as quilters will say it's whatever project I'm working on right now. Yeah. <laughs> because it, it is hard to pick one. It's like picking your favorite kid. Yeah. Well, we all have them, but we just don't admit to it. But <laughs> um, so another difficult question. And you've already talked about the the quilt with the crown. And I'm assuming then that that would be probably in the category of uh, an improv or an art quilt um it borders art quilt but my patterns are all written and they're traditionally pieced hmm. um but i have i feel more of a unique style because in my background rather than just having squares on a grid i have squares and rectangles kind of mixed together so you kind of have to examine the quilt to find out where the seams are that like would go all the way across to like how it's it's put together because there's no y seams because i hate y seams. oh yeah <laughs> who doesn't it's yeah easy. not anybody that says they love them um so here's the difficult question then if you had to give yourself a label as a quilter what would it be is it traditional is it modern free form experimental exploratory how would you characterize yourself it's a it's a hard question it is. And my husband had a really good word for it last week. We went to the Road to California quilt show and we were talking about it, um, like the difference between traditional quilting and modern quilting. And now I do not remember what he said, but I thought it was really good because I'm like in between modern and traditional. I use a lot of traditional techniques, um, traditional styling, but in a more modern way, like modern colorways, modern prints. Right. Oh, yeah. it's yeah kind of in between that yeah well it, it's an unfair question because I don't think any of us can be really labeled you know right we in everything I like traditional but I like modern um and and I'm, I'm slowly trying to get myself more into the real free form art style quilt as well that's scary to a certain extent yes I agree but, you know nothing ventured nothing gained in that yep. you know and that's what i like about the quilting world it's never the same twice you can you know do well it could be but i mean if you really want to enjoy it i think you got to mix it up a little bit and go out of your comfort zone um so i noticed that you're probably sitting in your uh work area so can you describe it for us is it is it a large space an extra bedroom what have you got it is a fairly small space. I want to say it's like 12 feet by maybe 14 feet. I don't know what that translates to in like meters. Um, it is about three quarters of a one car garage. Hmm. When our house was first built, this was just part of the yard. Oh, okay. It got converted to a carport and then it got converted to a garage and then it got converted to a bedroom with a really weird layout and then we converted it into my sewing room 
Okay, well, it's nice that you have your own sewing space. It beats the let's spread it out on the dining room table kind of Definitely. thing, you know. So that that's that's good. And it's not a bad size space from what you described. And I'm not sure what it is in meters either. I know I'm Canadian. I should, but <laughs> I, I still think in um, Imperial, except for weather. Okay. But in mileage. But <laughs> anyways, and you think after since we went to this in 1970s, I should be well versed in it. But now, nah, old dog, no new tricks uh, with that. Okay, so do you have a favorite tool or technique? Something you go to all the time? I have a feeling I know part of the answer to this. <laughs> I do go to my AccuQuilt quite often. Um, I don't really design much of my quilt, like my personal quilts with the Accu quilt in mind, but a lot of projects I'll do, like I needed to do a mug rug. So I went to my Accu quilt to make a uh, Hattie's Choice block. I have been doing a, like a round robin, round robin block swap with some folks online. And I've been trying to use my Accu quilt as much as possible. And when it's just like one block at a time, I just need a quick something. It's, it's wonderful. And you're an ambassador for them now, I think I heard you say. Yes, I am. So they call their ambassadors go-getters because mm -hmm. everything with AccuQuilt, it's the go. go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm a go-getter. I also, just starting this year, am co-hosting AccuQuilt Live alongside Pam Heller on Wednesdays. Oh, so well, that would be great. Be fun. Yeah. yeah. And is that started already or is it starting? Yep. Oh, it's yeah, I've done, okay. I think, three, three or four episodes now. It started at the beginning of the year. Do they do that on YouTube or is it on their website? It's on both. Oh. So they do it on their website and it's supposed to be on YouTube. They've had a couple glitches like this past Wednesday. For some reason, it wasn't showing up on YouTube, but it does go on to their YouTube live. Okay, so I'll have to look that up because I am an AccuQuilt fan as well. And I use it as much as possible. Um, but you're right. It doesn't, doesn't work with all applications, but quite a few of them but I love the series of videos you've done uh where you, they're very short but you roll the dice mm -hmm. and use the AccuQuilt and I think that is that looks like a lot of fun I should actually try that myself uh too it is a lot of fun so that started in November 2022 I made what I called my randomly generated quilt yes and I would roll the dice to pick one of I think there was only 12 patterns at that time because it was before I had the full cube I just had a couple random dies at that time right so I had patterns for what I could make out of those dies and I would roll the dice to pick my block pattern and then roll again to pick like which colors I was going to use because I was just pulling out of my scrap bag or bins which have <laughs> become unruly yeah they breed you know that right yeah yes they do <laughs> I swear like you make a scrap project to try and cut down on your scraps and you end up with more than you started yeah, with I exactly. don't know how it happens yep uh, but in 2023 I was using the same concept but had people sending me fabric so I would roll the dice for which block I was going to make but then just use whatever fabric was sent to me that I had never seen so I had no idea what it was going to look like well, I was fascinated by it. And I think, too, what I really like is the fact that they were short. Because you can sit yes. there and see the whole series in half an hour kind of a thing. And you, you get the you get the idea of how the AccuQuilt is working in your favor for putting those kind of things together. And I just the, the game element of it or the ch randomness of it, too, mm -hmm. I think. And that appeals to me because I like to do scrap quilts, uh, too, on, on occasion when I need a palette cleanser. That's what I call it, a mm -hmm. palette cleanser. I like to do that. But yes, you're right. The scraps, doesn't matter how many I use, I still don't put a dent in the pile. They just yep. multiply. Um, yep. So if you had all the money in the world, is there a piece of equipment you would invest in? I don't know if it'd be a single piece of equipment. I would want to build like a separate building for my craft stuff. So like a, a, I don't know, like a shed or, or something somewhere yeah. where I would have more space because space is something you can't really put a price on. It is just, yeah, it's wonderful to have dedicated space. And I think most people that sew or quilt would say the same thing. They You can't have too much space because you fill it. I mean, I have you a <laughs> big sewing area, but I, f I have filled it. And every now and then I have to do a purge. It's because mm -hmm. it's going to cave in on me but um yeah that would be really nice now 
what about uh, when you quilt your quilts? Do you quilt them on a domestic machine or do you have a long arm? I have a long arm. So I'm also a Grace Company ambassador and I have their Cunique 16X Elite and their version of automation. So that really helps me just get quilts done. So I don't have, have a pile a of quilt tops, a pile of UFOs just sitting yep. there waiting to be done. Yeah. And you have a Tin Lizzie, don't you? I used to. Oh, you don't? So, okay. I don't anymore. Yeah. I upgraded to this machine, I think last March or April. Um, and then I sold the Tin Lizzie to a friend so she can long arm her quilts now. Yeah. Because the Tin Lizzie's are like that company doesn't exist anymore. And they were right. one of the very first to put them out there on the market for the consumer uh to get their hands on too so i'm always fascinated by the history of those things i i have an apqs uh long arm i've had it for a couple of years now and i absolutely love using it but like you i have the computer component on it because free motion and, and me doesn't mix doesn't mix <laughs> so yeah the tin lizzie like there was no it was old yeah. there was no computer anything the um stitch regulator was iffy at best um so i got okay with doing free motion um i got pretty good at feathers actually that was kind of my my thing um then i discovered like quilting stencils so i would stencil out the quilt and then follow the lines with the tin lizzie so i had that practice but i love having the computer to just oh, yeah. plug in the design and let it do its thing yeah i love that and in fact all day yesterday i decided now it was time for me to to learn how to customize with the machine and and do different and I'm mm -hmm. I've got three quilt tops sitting there waiting to go and I'm just dying to get at it because this was easy I didn't realize I when you first get a long arm as I'm sure you know there's a learning curve uh, absolutely huge learning curve and when you get the computer component even more so so now I think I've got that I've mastered edge to edge so now it's time to do the customization and actually. I think it's going to go pretty good and I'm excited about that. Awesome. Um, but anyways, it's not about me. It's about you. <laughs> so have you ever belonged to an in-person group or a design team or an online group related to, to quilting or sewing? Yes, I am a member of the Portland Modern Quilt Guild. And two years ago, I was actually on the board uh, for the guild. Um, so I have that group. I'm in several Facebook groups for quilting. One of them is local-ish to Portland. Like it started in Portland, but it's branched out. You know, people have moved out of state or had friends that they brought in. Um, and we usually, there's a call every Saturday that you can just join the, like the Zoom call and everyone's sewing together. So that's a lot of fun. Um, and a lot of those folks are also part of the Portland Modern Quilt Guild. So I get to like meet them in person and sew along with them and, and all that. So are there a lot of men involved in these groups that you belong to? Um, well, there is one Facebook group that's dedicated solely to men who quilt. So that one is, you know, all men. Um, but within like the guild, there's probably just a handful of other guys that are active, at least that like show up to meetings. And, right and interact and how do how's now this is a tricky question because we don't want to offend the ladies but how do the ladies treat the gentlemen that when they first enter into the guild in my guild they're always welcomed with open arms like i was every other man i've seen come in is um portland is known for being a little more progressive than some places um, I've heard horror stories from other guys in their local guilds, which is really unfortunate because I really enjoy being a part of the guild. Yeah, I, that's why I asked you that question, because I was a member of my local guild and I was the only guy with 100 women and it was not a good experience. Oh, that's uh, unfortunate. And I've heard that from other men, too. But I'm glad to hear that, at least in the guild you're in, and I know there's other ones out there, too, that are very supportive, uh, you know, of having men join them. Because more and more of us are doing this uh, mm -hmm. now, too. So, you know, so it's good that that, that they sound supportive uh, and everything with it. And I wish mine had been a little bit more, but that may come over time. I don't know. I'm not there anymore. So, right, yeah. uh, but that's a story for another day. So, um, 
let's talk about stores or where you get your 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 fabric and your supplies do now you said you're in oregon right yes so oregon it has is that where uh sisters is yep sisters is in oregon and there's um the stitch in post they're the ones who like sponsor the sisters outdoor quilt show every year i've shopped there a couple times it's about mm, three hours from me and it's a tiny tiny town so it's not like a destination place you would go like if you're there you're there but you don't go there unless it's you don't really (laughs) yeah well i hear that they have well i've seen videos on youtube where every year they have the big outdoor quilt show for a day or something like that um so i've always been kind of interested in that but oregon's a bit of a ways from me where i am in uh, outside of toronto so (laughs) it's a bit of a flight but a bit uh, that bad um but anyways what i wanted to ask you though is i think your whole state i think has a lot of quilt stores across the state does it not Across the state, yes. Um, within Portland, where I live, they've been closing, unfortunately. Oh, okay. um, several years ago, it was right after we bought our house, actually. Um, fabric Depot, which was a huge, 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 huge fabric store, <clears throat> which was literally one mile from my house, closed. <clears throat> I think they closed in 2019. Um, and then there was another one called Cool Cottons that recently closed um there is one though that just opened i haven't been to yet they opened just week before weekend before last so i want to go check that out and it's um it's a man who owns the quilt shop so i'm excited to see how that goes yeah Um, but i end up shopping online a lot um i try to support small businesses i have several friends who have like online quilt shops so i'll go to them first for what i'm looking for uh, before i go to some of the other bigger well-known sites yeah it's important to support the the little ones because you know you've already identified what the problem is you have stores going out of business the brick Mm -hmm. and mortar and part of that is because of the internet and you know the influence of that and plus we all shopped on the internet more so than we ever had when we were all you know isolated because of the pandemic and it's carried over but I agree. It's nice to support the mom and pop shops that are there, even if they're just online. I like to do that as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, some people are adverse to buying fabric online because they like to feel it. I feel that if you buy brand name, you know, you know the name, you know, then you know the quality and then it just comes down to price. And how are prices in your area for uh, yardage? Not terrible. So like new released um like stuff from like free spirit fabrics moda the you know the the big names um they can usually go for like 14 ish dollars a yard um but if you wait a bit you can get them down to like eight dollars a yard like some of the older stuff so i just i like to shop for sales there Mm -hmm. are a few designers that i'll usually like jump on when it's a new release um but usually I like it's going to be sitting in my stash for a bit before I get to it. So I'm not really in a hurry to get this fabric unless it's something I think that isn't going to be available for very long. And I just really want to get my hands on it. Well, that brought up a couple of other points. Uh, first of all, the price um, you're saying around average, maybe about $14 a yard. Mm-hmm. And so Canadian, that would be about 19 teen dollars uh a yard of course we mostly buy in meters we get three inches more uh yeah. <laughs> but our our prices are very high right now i've our, heard yeah, yeah. there's 2021 22 23 uh uh meter is not uncommon now in canada so i'm lucky i have a store near to me that she's kept her prices at 16 dollars a meter so well, that's and she's good. got a good selection But yeah, I love a sale. Who doesn't love a sale because of the cost of fabric? But um, you mentioned designers. Uh, Do you have a few that you uh, gravitate towards? Yes. So Tula Pink, always just the bright colors. And it's usually, you know, animals and and it's just fun. Um, And then with Ruby Star Society, this print actually I'm wearing today is Sarah Watts. She's one of their designers and I've really found myself gravitating towards her art lately. Um, And then there's an artist who designs for Dear Stella fabrics called Ray Ritchie. 
Hmm. And she has more of a like a cottage core, almost gothy type vibe. So it's like the like skeletons, but she paints them and then it gets oh, converted okay. into a file for printing. And I really like her design. So they're three very different styles of designers. Um, I'm usually just drawn towards like bright colors, fun imagery, stuff like that. Yeah, bright colors I'm usually drawn to, you know, like I had the my whole phase with Kate Facet, you know, uh -huh. all that kind of stuff. I'm a little tired of him right now. But uh, yeah, that kind of stuff I'm I'm attracted to as well. So um, when you buy fabric, now this is a question I'm sure you've been asked. You've been in the quilt store, they're cutting your fabric for you, and there's somebody hanging over your shoulder and goes, oh, that's really nice. What are you going to do with it? What's your answer when you say it, when they say that? <laughs> Usually put it in my stash. Yeah. Often when I go, um, there's a, a craft store local to me. It's called Craft Warehouse. And they do a like a truckload fabric sale, I think twice a year. And I'll go and fill my cart with just like the flat fold fabric. Right. And then they hate me at the cutting counter because I'm like, I want a half a yard of each. <laughs> um, so I think last time I went, it was 54 cuts of fabric. And they were a half yard each for the most part. Um, Cause then I'll cut those in half to make fat quarters. Oh, right. When I'm designing, I use fat quarters a lot. So like they asked me, I'm like, Oh, I'm just restocking my fat quarter stash. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I usually tell them, uh, no, it's pretty. That's why I'm buying it because I'm, I'm a sucker. I don't necessarily, I don't buy for projects. I buy for future projects. And if it's pretty, I love it because you know, once you've seen it and if you don't buy it then next time you go in to get it it won't be there All gone it'll be yep. gone and so unlike you i buy everything by two meters two meters okay. two cuts on it because i figure well you know if a little's nice a lot's better so <laughs> and i have quite a stash and you know the more you put in your stash and you go to pull out fabric for a certain project there's always you have to buy more because you never have exactly the right color that you want for that to part. match it. Yep. <laughs> I know. yep. Every time. So yeah, doesn't matter how big your stash is. Um, so uh do you have any favorite uh experts or sources for information assistance when you're looking for, you know, it could be anything, a new technique, or you're looking for inspiration or when I first started. Probably more so. Like, I don't think I go to it as much. Like, I'm a lot more confident in my abilities. Um, so currently, like, I just have a group of friends, mostly on TikTok. There's a whole, like, quilting community on that app. Um, so I'll, like, bounce stuff off of them. But when I was first starting, my favorite channels to watch were Donna Jordan from Jordan Fabrics mm -hmm. and Angela Walters. At the time, she was still the Midnight Quilter through Craftsy. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, you know everything that happened there. Like, Craftsy went under yeah. and then came back and it's just a yeah. mess. But, um, but I still follow Angela Walters and her business. And that's where I got up the courage to like try the free motion quilting myself. Because that was really scary <laughs> to do. Yeah. And I mean, it, it it helps with, I used to watch the Midnight uh, Quilter show too. Uh, Angela Walters, I loved her. And uh, I think what I loved even better was she always had a glass of wine. Yep. <laughs> Sitting there somehow never spilled it on a quilt <laughs> no sure spilled on a quilt but i said i thought yeah that would make your free motion quilting so much easier a couple of glasses of wine you don't care <laughs> right <laughs> yep. until the next day and you look at it and go what was i thinking or i wasn't thinking um so that takes me to then let's talk about uh your youtube channel because you have one so your youtube channel is called uh rose city originals and you've already explained the rose city and you also have a website, but let's talk about your YouTube channel first. I've said a few things about it so far. When did you start it? I think I started my YouTube in either November or December of 2022. So it's been just over a year that I've had it. Yeah. And um, why? Why did you start one? So I, like all of my online presence, I started on TikTok. I was just doing random little short videos there that started really getting popular. And then I started Instagram, Facebook. I'm like, I should really do a YouTube so that I have somewhere to post longer videos, like full, like tutorial style, long format videos. So I started it up late 2022 with a goal in 2023 to be posting long format videos. 
um, which I did. Mm -hmm. I have several in there, not as many as I would like, but I tend to gear more towards the short format videos. So like YouTube shorts has been really fun. Um, Cause that's just the way my brain thinks. I'm usually just like a little bit at a time. I can edit a 60 second video way faster than I can edit a, you know, a 30 minute video. <laughs> so yeah. well, I tell you the way to get around that. Don't edit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, there'd be a lot of bleeping if I did. <laughs> uh, I don't, I don't even worry about that. I just know I hate editing. I'll do a little bit, but not much. And if I trip over my tongue, I trip over my tongue. I am human uh, with it. But uh, yeah, so your um, your user base then, or your subscriber base then, I didn't look at your latest number, but you're you're getting up there. Um, yeah, I am approaching 10,000 followers. Which is darn good for the length of time you've had it. I just uh, went yeah. over 10,000 and I've had a YouTube channel since 2012. So oh, wow. Of course, well, congratulations. I, did, I didn't do Idiot Quilter, though. I only started Idiot Quilter on my channel. I was a crafter before. So, okay. and I totally different niche, right? And so I didn't start the Idiot Quilter until only a couple of years ago. Well, during pandemic, I started okay. it. And, you know, it, but it's taken a while. Now, once you hit 10,000, somebody told me the algorithms are your best friend. And yeah, it's true. They really do. So, well, that's quite an accomplishment. So you're doing something right for sure on that because you're getting a lot and that your videos are good. I quite enjoy them. And oh, thank you. I do like the short format uh, for them too. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, it's not so good for a tutorial, but that's not what your purpose is when you do the shorts, I don't think. Right. So much. Yeah, the shorts are more just like, here's what I did Yeah. versus like the tutorials, like here's how you can make whatever it is I'm making. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So do you have any plans for expansion of your YouTube channel? Like what you've already kind of said that you want it to be uh, longer format videos on there, but what kind of things down the road can uh, your subscribers expect to see? Probably a lot of AccuQuilt content, <laughs> AccuQuilt projects. But yeah, I want to do more, more long format tutorial style videos maybe some sew alongs i might be doing that later this year so and will they be sort of a mixture between quilting and uh garment sewing or probably mostly quilting um i do actually have a pattern i released last year that's a quilted trucker hat so it's kind of like a bridge between both um and then i have a couple of videos already on my youtube about how i make my shirts it's a it's a commercial pattern but i've made some alterations to it and then i just kind of walk through the steps because when i first read the pattern a few of the things they did made zero sense to me like my brain just could not wrap my head around what it was they were trying to explain so i show the way i do it in my videos yeah i'll have to put my husband onto that because he is a garment sewer and he makes a lot of shirts i'm not actually i'm not wearing one of his shirts today but uh he makes a lot of my shirts of the style that you're wearing there as well and uh yeah he, he can compare notes to how you do things because he doesn't follow the patterns completely either you know uh he mm -hmm. has little tips and tricks and things that he does uh too um so let's talk about your website then so what will we find on your website? Well, I am a quilter. I'm not a web designer. So that's been a challenge. It's a very simplistic website. But over there, you can find all of the patterns that I have for sale. Um, there is some tabs that are information specifically about AccuQuilt because I'm an ambassador, um, the Grace Company, and Sewing Parts Online. Like every company I'm an ambassador for, there's a tab to like learn more about them and what they offer. Um, I have a tab for my community quilt project because I am doing it again in 2024 with the random fabrics. And I think that's probably all that's on there. It's very simple. <laughs> now, I want to ask you about the community quilt. What is that? So the community quilt, that's, we were talking about it a little earlier. I'm rolling the dice to pick different block patterns. And then I'm using fabric that's sent into me by my followers. And it's followers from all the different platforms. So it's all over the world. Um, and I'll find out which block pattern I'm making that day and then just start opening up envelopes until I have enough fabric to make that block. Mm -hmm. So I'll have fabric from Iowa mixed with fabric from Australia and Japan and just wherever it happens to be. And it's fabric I've never seen before. 
that doesn't necessarily go well together. Uh, but I just use it and make the best of it and get a really funky block out of it. Um, I use this as, I call it a community quilt because it's being created by the community, like everyone's sending in their fabrics. And then at the end of the year, it gets raffled off and um, the proceeds benefit the Trevor Project, which is a US-based uh, organization that helps with counseling and suicide prevention for LGBTQIA plus youth. Yes, I know that. And that was my, my next question was going to be, what do you do with them afterwards when you have them? But you've just answered that. And that's a great, great cause for that because I, yes, I'm very aware of the Trevor Project uh, too, because we have branches of it here in Canada. Oh, awesome. So, yeah. So in fact, I think it's pretty international these days. I think there's branches in uh, over in uh, the UK as well, and possibly in different spots in Europe too. So it's I really to take check off. that. What, yeah. uh, when I was picking the the charity last year, which was the first year I did this project, because fabric was coming from all over the world, I was trying to find something that would benefit, you know, more globally, which was really hard to find. So if they have branches international, that's awesome because that's really what I want to go for is really building that, you know, worldwide community in quilting that's benefiting the world. Right. right. Well, I, I think they do. Um, I'm pretty sure I read about that, that they, at least in the UK, I'm pretty okay. sure they do there too. Um, so for the future, do you have any challenges or goals, things you want to do, uh, maybe things you want to try? I'm behind in setting my goals for this year. Um, last year, I had set goals to start teaching, like formally teaching classes and releasing four quilt patterns. I ended up releasing three patterns because my fourth one I'm still working on and it just got delayed. Um, and I did teach a couple in-person workshops. So I met my goals, I say, for last year. Um, for this year, I want to expand upon teaching classes, whether in-person or virtually, but like actually like leading workshops. Right. Um, what was the other one? I just had it in my head. I don't remember now. Well, that's okay. In my case, I usually call that a senior moment. But, <laughs> uh, but uh, well, that sounds like you've got a lot on your plate coming up. So do you, because you have the website, because you do patterns, because you want to teach, is this a full-time job for you or do you have a day job? <laughs> I still have my normal like eight to five day job as well. I'm lucky that I get to work from home for that job. So I don't, you know, lose time in my day for commuting, but pretty much like right at five o'clock, I go from my corporate job to my quilting job. Yeah. So. Well, you, you're accomplishing quite a bit given that, you know, most of your day is taken up with a day job um, kind of thing. Um, I don't worry about that. I'm retired. So <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to that day. <laughs> and believe me, it's wonderful. So, uh, so do you have any advice for anyone that might want to get started into like quilting or in sewing in general? Any tips? Yes. So the number one tip that I always give new quilters, because I get asked that a lot, is it all comes out in the wash. Mm. And it's a very true statement. I don't know if it was invented by someone who sewed, but it very much applies to quilting when you are making your first quilt, it's not going to be perfect. Like set yourself up with the expectation it's not going to be perfect, but you're going to learn a lot from it. Mm -hmm. So as you're sewing it and you're, you know, your seams aren't matching up, you're losing points. If you're doing free motion quilting, maybe your lines are just a mess. It's okay. Once you wash that quilt and the batting shrinks up and the thread shrinks and the back, like everything shrinks up and you get that quilt crinkle, which I personally love. I do too it hides all of those little imperfections. Yep. You just see this wonderful quilt as a whole and it's a perfectly functional quilt. Even if you may think it's ugly or it didn't turn out how you want it, it's still a functional piece that you can use. Yep. So I always encourage folks to finish their project. Like even if you're not loving it, you're, you know, you can be disheartened by it, but still finish it, put binding on it, give it a wash and use it. It could be a couch throw. It could be on your kid's bed, whatever. Every time you see it, you're going to remember 
that experience and you're going to learn from it. Your next quilt's going to be a little better. Your next quilt's going to be even better than that. And you just, you, it's a, it's an art form and it's learned over time. It's not something that most people could just jump into and right off the bat have a perfect quilt as their first quilt. I don't know anyone whose first quilt was perfect. Yeah, well, my husband's was, but oh. <laughs> that's a bone of contention. And he doesn't like quilting. That's why he went to garden. Oh, geez. So okay. Better. But uh, but you're you're quite right that like once you wash it, yep. Yeah, I like that crinkly look too. Or as I will say to people, because I heard this from someone else, well, it'll quilt out. <laughs> yeah. That's and true too. Yeah. It's amazing what how once you get the binding on a quilt, how it changes it. So I think it's a good advice you're giving there. Finish it because the yes. binding is the last part of it. Once that goes on, you will be surprised the transformation the quilt will take. I don't know why. It's a mystery. But yeah, um, yeah. so do you, before we say goodbye, and thank you so much for, for doing this, is there anything else you'd like to say? Anything that we haven't covered or something you would uh, like people to know about you or about your YouTube channel or anything? I don't think so. Um, I give a couple talks. I'm actually speaking at my guild next month. Um, and I've chosen the topic of purposefully imperfect. Ooh. So kind of going back to that bit of advice for finishing your quilt, even if you're a more ex experienced quilter, if you have a project that you're just, you're not in love with anymore, um, I still encourage you to finish it because it's going to get it off your plate, both physically and mentally. Like I've had UFOs that I recall their existence. They're in a drawer. They're in the closet. Every once in a while, it creeps back up in my brain. Like, oh, I should probably work on that and finish it. And then I forget about it for another six months and then it comes back. But if you take that project and you do finish it, it's done. Whether you keep it, gift it, donate it, whatever, it's not going to keep surfacing. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly. It's not going to keep haunting you to finish it. So I always just say, make sure you, you finish your projects. I don't have a lot of UFOs because I'm usually like, I'm focusing on one, maybe two projects, but I want to see it all the way through so that I can mentally break from it and move on to the next project. Yeah. I, I kind of think that way too. Uh, the most, I usually have maybe two projects on the go. One may be a quilt. The other one might be an embroidery project because I mm -hmm. love embroidery uh, kind of a thing, but yeah. And I, don't have don't usually have any ufos or if i have a ufo it's i only have it for a matter of days because i have to finish things i have to do it even though i might think i'm going to hate it i've got to finish it and some of those projects you know like you said it comes out in the wash after you you may have hated it but when you get it all done it could end up being one of your favorite projects it's weird how that works i've had many quilts like that like i hated it up to the point i put binding on it, and then all yeah. of a sudden it's like Okay, I I like the way it turned out. That's right. It's magic. Yeah. It's just absolutely it is. <laughs> cool well, thing magic. Yep. Thank you so much for uh, agreeing to do this interview. I find very your your YouTube channel is fascinating. Your uh, I love the things that you've said about your experience with quilting, and I look forward to more content. Uh, watching more content on your YouTube channel, and uh, I wish you lots of success with all your endeavors because it sounds to me like. You have a lot going on. So that's yes. great. So thank you, Chris, so much for that. I will put in the show notes below this interview, uh, your uh, media. I'll have your website and I'll have your uh, YouTube channel. If there's anything else you want me to post, you can send that to me in email. And I'll also include that as well. And do stay on the line here as I say goodbye. But thank you so much for meeting with me today. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And I hope to be talking to you again soon. And you are now going to be my AccuQuilt go-to person as right. well on that. So thanks so much, Chris. Enjoy Thank the you. rest of your day. Thank you.